Okay, so now we're going to get into the gene expression, how things are inherited, how traits are inherited, um, and really the science of genetics. This is a lot of information, a lot of different things, a lot of different moving parts to keep track of. Um, so we'll, we'll spend a few days on this. So we're going to start with, um, well, we're going to start with what people originally started noticing was that um, progeny, or especially in humans, children look like their parents, but not exact copies. Um, and so there was this um, observation that traits are being passed from parents to offspring, but exactly how um, wasn't discovered until the father of genetics, um, Gregor Mendel, did a bunch of experiments with pea plants. And the reason why he chose pea plants is because um, other research showed that peas could make hybrids, so you could cross different types of peas. There were lots of different pea varieties available. They were easy to grow, and they can self or cross fertilize. So you can take a flower and fertilize another flower on the same plant, or you can take uh, the stamens off, which hold the pollen, which hold the sperm, and make sure that self-fertilization doesn't occur, and then cross it with another plant. So some terms and some things that Mendel did was he took true breeding individuals. And what a true breeding individual is, is when you cross um, a true breeding individual with another true breeding individual, they always produce the same trait. Okay, so self fertilization results. So the purple flowers, all of the progeny have purple flowers. Okay, you can do the same thing with white flowers, but um, if they are not um, true breeding, then some of their offspring, so like here, you have two purple flowers from this plant, some of their um, seeds developed plants that had white flowers. So these are not true breeding. Um, and so what Mendel did was he took two true, true breeding individuals and he did a monohybrid cross. So he took a true breeding purple flower and a true breeding white flower and he, all of their progeny were um, purple. And then once he, then he self-fertilized those and found that some of them were purple and some of them were white. So this is the parental um, offspring. This is or the parental types. This is the F1 or first filial generation. And then a self-fertilization there would be a F2 or second filial generation. So Mendel's first experiment, the plants resembled only one parent. So the F1 progeny were just purple like in that other example. This is referred to as the dominant trait. And the other trait that was not expressed was the recessive trait. So no plants with characteristics were found that were intermediate. So we didn't find any pink or yeah or light blue or something like that flowers. They were either just purple or white. This disproved the theory of blended inheritance which was popular at the time that um, parents produced offspring that was somehow somewhere in between um, two different traits. But this showed one or the other, not a blended. So the F2 generation then, so after taking um, your purple offspring from your F1 generation and self-fertilizing them, um, showed the reemergence of the recessive trait in small numbers. And this was always in a three to one ratio. When he counted it out, it was three of the dominant one to the recessive. But three to one is actually one to two to one because of the way that the genes are on the plant. So one of them is true breeding. Two of them will are not true breeding. They have um, one of the dominant and one of the recessive traits. And then the one is the true breeding recessive.
Okay, so that's what that says. So the five element model is what he came up with. First is that parents transmit discrete factors. This was later called genes. And each individual receives one copy of a gene from each parent. Not all of the copies of a gene are identical. So an allele is an alternative form of a gene. So we have a big A allele, which codes for purple, and a little A allele, which codes for white. Homozygous means two of the same alleles. So these are this is a homozygous plant because it has two of the alleles for purple. This also because it has two of the alleles for white. Heterozygous is different alleles, so this plant here has one allele for purple and one for white, so it is heterozygous. It has two different alleles. Alleles remain discrete or unique, and there's no blending. This is the fourth element of the model, and five the presence of allele does not guarantee expression, so you have a dominant and a recessive. Um, not always, but in, in many of the cases which have been looked at, they were dominant and recessive. The genotype then is the total set of alleles an individual contains, so the genotype here is big A, big A. The phenotype is the physical expression, so the phenotype here is the purple flower. So uh, one of Mendel's principles that he came up with is the principle of segrega segregation, which is that two alleles for a gene segregate. Okay, they aren't. So if you have a purple and a white allele, um, they will go in opposite directions, right? During gamete formation and are rejoined at random, one from each parent during fertilization. So this um, goes along with meiosis um, and just basically says that we have things, um, chromosomes going to opposite ends of the pole during anaphase. The physical basis for allele segregation is the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis, which we talked about. And But Mendel did not really have any knowledge of meiosis. He just noticed that these genes, these alleles, separated. All right, so one of the ways in which you can predict the probability of the phenotypes or genotypes is by looking at a Punnett square. So if you cross a purple flowered plant with a white flowered plant and big P is the dominant allele for purple, little p is the recessive allele for white, a true breeding white flowered plant is little p little p because it's homozygous, a true breeding purple flowered plant is big P big P so it's homozygous. So big P little p is heterozygous purple for the flowered plant. Okay so if your parents are big P, big P, you would write the, let's say the male is big P, big P, you would write that across here, one P here and one P there. And the mother is little P, little P, you would write that along there. And then just fill in the squares with what corresponds with each of them. All right, so here's just an example of some dominant and recessive traits found in humans. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these later. A dominant trait only requires one copy of the gene for expression, and a recessive trait requires two copies of the gene for expression. So recessive traits are generally less represented in a population, um, unless the dominant trait is has a, an extreme disadvantage. If it's dominant and its expression will significantly reduce survival reproduction, then it will quickly um, be weeded out of the gene pool. All right, so that's a, that was a monohybrid cross. So if you add another trait into the mix, then you can make a dihybrid cross. So this is the examination of two separate traits in a single cross, and it produces true, bre true breeding lines for two traits, okay? So here we have round and we have color. Uh, so the texture of the seed and the color of the seed. Round would be big R, wrinkled would be little r, yellow would be big Y, and green would be little y. Okay, so what you can do is take two that are true breeding for each trait, cross them, and each one will be heterozygous for both traits. Then you allow them to self-fertilize, and when you look at the different genotypes and phenotypes, it's 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Round yellow, round green, wrinkled yellow, and wrinkled green. Okay, so this is a good 
um, ratio to remember, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So, um, Mendel came up with this observed, this observation led to his second um, principle, which is the principle of independent sorbent. So in a dihybrid cross, the allele of each gene is not connected to the other gene, so they assort independently. Um, and this has to do with non-different chromosomes. So, so we talked about this in meiosis. The males, the, the, during meiosis, when the chromosomes separate, they don't go all from the mother on one side and all from the father on the other side. They just uh, align randomly. And they also do crossing over, which also, also mixes up the genes as well. Okay. So then to figure things out as to probabilities, we can use a couple rules. We can use the rule of addition. This is the probability of two mutually exclusive events occurring simultaneously is the sum of their individual probability. So really, you use this when you're talking about, well, what's the probability of having um, heterozygous or homozygous alleles in your flower? Um, so if the key is the word or. Okay, so when crossing big P, big, little P, big P, little P, the probability of producing big P, little P offspring is the probability of getting big P, little P is 1 in 4, plus the probability of getting little P, big P, which is 1 in 4, add them together, it's 1 half. Multiplication is something uh, when you're talking about two independent events occurring simultaneously is the product of their individual probability. So this is when you're talking about and. So if you're crossing XX and XY, the probability of uh, obtaining XY offspring is the probability of obtaining Y, which is one half, and the probability of obtain obtaining X, which is one from the mother. So the probability of XY is one times one half equals one half. So if you're saying the word and in there, then you're using the rule of multiplication. A test cross is something used to determine the genotype of an ind individual with a dominant phenotype. So if you don't know if it is heterozygous or homozygous, you can cross it with a homozygous recessive. And if it's homo homozygous dominant, then all of the offspring will be phenotypically the dominant. However, if it's home if it's heterozygous, all of the offspring will some of the offspring will show the recessive trait. So beyond Mendel, um, there are a few other um, um, other things. But Mendel's mode of inheritance assumed that each trait is controlled by a single gene each gene only has two alleles and there's a clear dominant recessive relationship but that's not the case on all of the genes uh, most genes do not meet this criteria some genes or some traits are polygenic which occurs when multiple genes are involved in controlling the, the phenotype phenotype these traits show continuous variation okay for example human height you are not either tall or short you can be somewhere in between, and this all depends on a number of genes which are influencing height. Pleiotropy is another um, example where um, an allele which has more than one effect on the phenotype. So an example of this is um, cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. Uh, there can be only there may be only one trait which causes a whole host of different uh, problems. So this is all the things that can go wrong with cystic fibrosis, which is just one gene, one trait um, that is different. There may also be more than two alleles for a gene in a population. So one person can only have two alleles at one locus, but um, an example of this is blood types. So you have A type blood, B type blood, and O type blood, which is from three different alleles. Each individual can only have two, but there are others in the population as well. 
Incomplete dominance then is where you have some intermediate um, when you have a heterozygous. Um, and an example of this is when you have some flowers, if you cross red and white, you will get a reduced amount of pigment and reduced amount of color in the progeny. Codominance is where both things are expressed. An example of this is blood types. You can have AB blood where both you have both A blood and B blood. <clears throat> you also have environmental influences. So the coat color in Himalayan rabbits and Siamese cats. This allele produces an enzyme that allows pigment production only at temperatures below 30 degrees. So the ears and the tail and towards the feet, um, which are exposed to a colder temperature in the nose, are going to produce the black. But above it, everything else is going to be white. Epistasis is another um, genetic occurrence where one of the genes affects the expression of another gene. So an example of this is uh, purple corn. You have to have both a big A and a big B to get purple corn. If you just if you have little a, little a, and big B, then you won't get you'll get white, <clears throat> and vice versa. So when Emer Emerson crossed two white varieties of corn, F1 was all purple, but then it didn't show a three to one ratio. It showed a nine to seven ratio, which wasn't expected. All right, so now we're going to get a little more into different types of genes and also talk about uh, different genetic abnormalities. So T.H. Morgan in 1910 worked with a, a fruit fly, Drosophila melan melanogaster, and he discovered that a mutant male fly had white eyes instead of red. So he crossed the mutant male to a normal red-eyed female, and all of them showed the dominant trait. He then crossed F1 females with F1 males, and the F2 generation contained red and white-eyed flies, but all the white-eyed flies were male. So he's showing a pattern that you're having some sort of inheritance with the sex. A test cross of an F1 female with a white-eyed male showed that um, some of the females could be white-eyed, but most of them were not. And Morgan concluded that the eye color gene must reside on the X chromosome. And so if it's on the X chromosome, which is larger than the Y chromosome, if you don't have, if you only have one X, then, and the allele for white eyes is on there, and males have a one X and one Y, then it's more likely that they will show the expression of the trait. So sex determ determination in Drosophila and humans is based on this X and Y uh, chromosome imp inheritance pattern. So if you have two X's, you're female. If you have one X and one Y, you're a male. Humans have 46 total. 22 of them are autosomal, which means they are not sex chromosomes, and one pair of sex chromosomes, and the Y is much smaller, again, than the X. There are some other organisms that have different um, different ways of doing this. So, uh, males and Drosophila, the heter the homozygous is a female. In birds, the homozygous is a male. In grasshoppers, if you have two alleles, you're female. If you have one allele, you're male. In honeybees, if you're diploid, you are female. And if you are haploid, you are male. So, kind of interesting. So sex linkage, then, is genetic diseases that affect males to a greater de degree than Females. So an X-linked recessive allele is one found on the X chromosome, and examples of that include red-green color, color blindness. So if you are red-green colorblind, you cannot see the the um, number in this one, which is 74. Um, also, you won't be able to see the numbers in this one, which is 501, if you are red-green colorblind, a different type. All right, I'm just kidding. There's no numbers in there, so you're not colorblind. There's actually a sailboat here. You should be able to see. Hemophilia is another example of an X-linked trait. Um, and it is caused by an X-linked recessive allele. So heterozygotes are asymptomatic because they have a normal X. Um, but if you are a male and you have the recessive allele, then you will have hemophilia. So a lot of females can be carriers and be just fine. 
And this, uh, this trait was introduced into a number of different European royal families by Queen Victoria of England. And because of the, um, the royal family having to marry cousins and so on and so forth, it was passed um, throughout the royal family. Dosage compensation is where um, the amount of a gene affects the trait. So females have two X's and males only have one. And each female one X chromosome is inactivated and is highly condensed into a bar body. Okay, so here's an inactive bar body in this cell. And so um, that's what gives the calico coloration in, uh, in cats. Some of them are turned on. Um, some of the X chromosomes have the allele for um, black fur and some of them for orange fur. So the other allele would be inactivated in those. So they are mosaics, meaning they have differences among their different cells. So some exceptions to these chromosome theories are mitochondria and chloroplasts because like we remember from our endosymbiotic theory and discussion, they have their own genes. Genes from mitochondria and chloroplasts are often passed to the offspring by only one parent, usually the mother, and this is um, called maternal inheritance. So early geneticists realized they could obtain information about the distance between genes on a chromosome by looking at the recombination or crossing over patterns between the genes. If crossover occurs, if again these are genes on the same chromosome, uh, then they're going to produce a new combination. Um, if they're on the cr same chromosome, you expect them to be uh, inherited together, but crossing over messes that up. So by studying the number of recombinants, you can um, estimate the distance between the chromosomes. Uh, so Alfred Sturtevant was a undergraduate of T.H. Morgan, and he put Morgan's observations that recombinant progeny reflected relevant location of genes into quantitative terms. So he gave it an amount. Um, and genes that are further apart are more likely to be separated by a crossing over event. So recombinant events are more likely in genes that are farther apart. Those ones that are closer together are more likely to stay together. And so if you just count the frequency of recombination events, um, that will help you determine how far away they are. 1% recombination means one map unit. That means they would be really close. Um, this is also called a centimorgan. Um, you can do the same thing with three genes. If you use three lo loci instead of two to construct maps as to where these genes are on the chromosome. If any of the three-point crosses, um, in any three-point crosses, the class of offspring with two crossovers is the least frequent. So those that are most frequent are going to be the normal without crossing over and then you'll have two that'll be in the middle and one that'll be very rare and that'll be the double crossover all right so human genome maps are basically studying where genes are on the different types of chromosomes um, and this can be derived from historical pedigrees but is very difficult. Um, so uh, this changed with the development of anonymous markers. So using molecular techniques we can um, look at genes that don't have any detectable phenotype. Um, another example of patterns of genes on a chromosome is called a SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphism. And this is something that is um, a different by only one um, nucleotide and affects the base of a single locus. Um, and it's used to increase the resolution in forensic analysis. Okay, so if you look at SNPs, which are just very, very small changes in a gene, um, one person will have a unique set of SNPs. Alright, sickle cell anemia was the first human disease to be shown 
um, as a result of a mutated protein, and the mutated protein was hemoglobin. Um, and it leads to an impaired oxygen delivery to tissues. Now, if you're homozygous for sickle cell anemia, you'll have a reduced, a very impaired ability to move oxygen throughout your body. But heterozygotes are resistant to malaria because of the shape of the cell. But they have enough of the, the good red blood cells that they can um, function fairly normally. Non-disjunction is an event where the uh, chromosomes, we talked about this with meiosis, don't, um, don't go to opposite sides of the cell as they properly should. And so an aneuploid is one that, that either loses or gains a chromosome. If it's a monosomy, it's a loss. If it's a trisomy, it's a gain. So if you have only one when you should have two, it's monosomy. If you have three when you should have two, it's tris trisomy. Most of them are terminal, will end in death, but very, very small ones can present three copies and allow an individual su to survive. So trisomy 21 is Down syndrome, which leads to many um, genetic abnormalities, but um, still results in survival of uh, the offspring. Some other examples include triple X females, triple X, double XY males, which is called Klinefelter syndrome, or XO females, which is called Turner syndrome. You cannot live without an X chromosome. It has some very important traits on it. So if you are OY, then you are, um, will not survive. XYY males is another syndrome called Jacob syndrome. And so all of these are different abnormalities with having to do with the sex chromosome. All right, genomic imprinting is the phenotype exhibited by a particular allele. It depends on which parent contributed to the allele of to to, to the offspring. So, the gen, the imprinting is done by whether it's from the mother or the father. So, a deletion in chromosome 15, if it comes from the father, will result in Prader-Willi syndrome. If it um, comes from the mother, it's called Engelmann syndrome. Okay, and it has some slight um, genetic abnormalities, differences there. Epigenetics is the changes in the DNA and histones that can be inherited. So this is not genes, but the things surrounding the genes, which affect the expression of genes. Um, the process of kind of turning genes on and off is called DNA methylation, um, where you put methyl groups around these nucleosomes and other areas to make sure that they are expressed or not. Um, these can be altered because of changes in the chromosome structures, and those can be inherited. So an example of this, if you look at 50-year-old twins, they can have different expression of genes depending on what, which genes were methylated and which ones were not. All right, so finally, you can detect genes um, using a pedigree analysis, so looking at father, mother, grandma, grandpa, and all the different types of um, genetic disorders they may have, or you can do uh, a couple different things. You can do one procedure called amniocentesis, which is a genetic analysis done on fetal cells collected from the amniotic fluid. Okay, um, because that will have, uh, in the amniotic fluid, will have cells similar to the baby. Or you can do chronic chorionic villi sampling, which is a genetic analysis from cells collected from the placenta for examination. Again, they will have. So this is amniocentesis here. This is chorionic villi sam sampling. They will also have cells in there similar to the um, growing fetus. Finally, one other procedure you can do uh, is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And this takes advantage of in vitro fertilization. So multiple eggs are harvested from a female. It is um, fertilized by sperm outside the body, so in a petri dish or whatever, and then they can genetically analyze these as they let. So they let them grow to about the 16 state, 16 cell stage, and then they can pull a very very small needle and pull one of those cells out without damaging the embryo, and do genetic analysis on that cell. Then they can screen for genetic diseases um, on the different embryos, and you can decide which one of those uh, 
healthy embryos you would like to implant into the uterus. Um, and we'll talk about in class whether you think this is ethical or not.